Hello everyone and welcome to The Seventh Student. Today we're doing C1.1, which is enzymes and metabolism. So let's get started. What is an enzyme? Okay, an enzyme is a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction, but is not changed by the reaction, so it's not used up. They are basically biological catalysts, and it just allows for life processes to happen at a faster rate. Now, they're actually proteins, okay? They're globular proteins, and they have a very precise 3D shape and an active site, which you can see over here. So the active site changes in shape, and it fits that of the substrate. Uh, often it's actually only a few amino acids in the enzyme that are necessary to create the chemical conditions to change the substrate into a product. Uh, and often these amino acids in the active site are brought together when the polypeptide, the enzyme polypeptide, folds. That's why the enzyme's 3D structure is vital, as we'll see further along the line. Whilst the substrate is bound to the active site, as you can see here, it forms the enzyme substrate complex, and then it's converted into the product, which is then released. Great. So where, does, where do enzymes fit in? Well, they fit into metabolism. So metabolism, a simple way to understand it, it's all the chemical reactions that occur in living organisms, right? Uh, most reactions happen inside cells, but some are ex extracellular, such as the digestion of foods in the intestine. Now, reactions form pathways normally, so they can be chains of reactions or cycles, and almost all metabolic reactions are catalyzed by an enzyme, so that means we need a lot of different enzymes uh, to do all, all of these reactions. Um, and enzyme specificity allows organisms to control metabolism, because you can produce a specific enzyme in, in certain amounts, and that will determine how much of that reaction occurs. Metabolism can also be divided into catabolism and anabolism. So Anabolic reactions basically build up smaller molecules into larger ones. You can see that here. That requires energy. On the other hand, catabolic reactions break down large molecules into smaller ones, so it releases energy. Examples of anabolism include protein synthesis, cellulose synthesis, photosynthesis. Uh, catabolism examples include the digestion of food, uh, including glycogen or proteins, and cellular respiration. Great. So how do enzymes bind to substrates? Well, it's actually not that simple. So basically a substrate's movement is random, but when it is close enough to an enzyme, the chemical properties of the enzyme attract it towards the active site. Once they interact, both of them change their conformation. So this is called induced fit binding. It used to be thought that it was just like a lock and key. They were complementary from the get-go, but it seems that when they first interact, they change, that's why it's called induced, right? They induce the fitting, uh, so they change their conformation a little. And these changes to the substrate make it easier for bonds within them to break and new bonds to form, which is really what we need to happen for products to form, right? From reactants to products. And then once that's done, products can detach and the enzyme can return to its original state. And then again, upon interaction with another substrate, they'll change their conformation. Great. Okay, so let's look at the physics. <laughs> Yay, I know. Let's look at the physics of enzymes. So basically, a substrate can only bind to the active site if it's very close to it. So for that, a substrate active site collision needs to happen. Now, you have to imagine reactions happen for the most part in the cytoplasm. So that's a liquid and molecules are moving within it in a random direction, both substrates and enzymes. So it is completely random that substrates and enzymes come together. However, if there's, if there's more substrate or enzyme, uh, the rate of collision will increase just because there's more and there's a higher chance, right? For a collision to be successful, you also need the substrate and active site to be aligned so that they combine together. So it's not that easy. Um, in some cases, though there's exceptions. So in some cases, substrates are very, very large and they don't move and it's the enzymes that move. So for example, when replicating DNA, DNA is the substrate, but it's not moving. And then in other cases, enzymes don't move. So for example, sometimes they can be membrane bound. And in that case, it's the substrate that has to move. Great. So remember I was saying the enzymes 3D structure is very important? Well, uh, the 3D structure, as you probably remember, the tertiary structure or quaternary structure, uh, you can review that topic if you don't, it depends on very weak interactions between amino acids. So remember, it's hydrophobic and hydrogen bonds. Um, and depending on these, it's the enzyme substrate specificity varies, right? So most enzymes only bind one substrate, whilst others are less specific. And that depends on these bonds, right, that hold the enzyme together. However, the bonds holding the enzyme together can be affected by heat and acidity. And this can change the active site, right? Because it can change the structure of the enzyme. 
If that means that the substrate can bind, then the enzyme loses its ability to catalyze reactions, and then we call that denaturation, okay? So for example, when you fry an egg, I know that's a very weird example, but when you fry an egg, you can see um, how it goes from being transparent to solidifying. That's because all of the enzymes in the egg are denaturing. But anyways, aside from that, so basically, if you look at these factors, right, for pH, enzymes normally have an optimum pH here at the top, where their activity is the highest. And then when the pH increases or decreases from the optimum, the bonds are all altered in the enzyme, so it leads to denaturation. In terms of temperature, Temperature actually increases the speed of movement of the substrate and the enzyme. So it increases the likelihood of collision and therefore enzyme rates. So that's at the start, right? You can see at more temperature, actually a higher rate of reaction. But that's only true till a certain point, because afterwards, the bonds that hold the enzymes together can also break, causing denaturation, you guessed it. Um, and then thirdly, substrate concentration. This does not cause denaturation, but the more substrate there is, the more collisions will occur because it's just more packed, right, the space. So the enzyme activity increases. However, there comes a point where that plateaus, right, that's what you see here, the straight line, uh, and that's because there's so much substrate that basically all active sites are occupied, so the enzyme activity cannot increase more, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Great, this is just a little extra, but you need to know this. Um, you need to be able to measure enzyme catalyzed reactions, and more importantly, the reaction rate. So you can do that in two ways. Just remember this. You can allow the reaction to happen for a fixed amount of time and measure the amount of substrate that's used up, or you can start with a known amount of substrate and measure the time for a reaction to go to completion, right? You just need to know something so that you can um, then divide over time and get an accurate rate. Great. So how do enzymes actually work? Uh, again, a little bit of physics. So substrates, basically, or reactants, right, have to pass through a transition state before they are converted into products energetically, right? So energy is required to reach this transition state all the way up here. Um, that energy is actually called the activation energy. And that activation energy is used to break bonds in the substrate molecules, which will allow for them to be converted into products. And that's when you see it go down all the way to the products, right? What enzymes do, actually, is they're lowering the activation energy of the reaction. And that's because, you know how we talked about how uh, when they're going to bind the induced fit, it changes the conformation of the substrate. Basically, what it does is it weakens bonds in the substrate, right, as it's binding to the active site, so then less energy is required to break them to then change them up into products. And that's why the rate of the reaction increases. Hope that's clear. Because we're moving on to higher level. And at this point, I do want to say, if you like my videos, please do subscribe. I've noticed most of you who watch them are not subscribed, and it really helps out a lot, so I would really, really appreciate it. But with that being said, let's move on and keep going. So, location, location, location. So, where are enzymes located? Well, okay, so we've said enzymes are proteins, so they have to be synthesized by ribosomes. So basically, extracellular enzymes are made in ER ribosomes. By extracellular enzymes, I mean enzymes that are going to go outside of the cell. They're made in ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and released from cells, whereas intracellular enzymes are synthesized by free ribosomes. And again, you can go back to proteins. We've discussed this further in that video. Um, so intracellular enzymes will catalyze pathways such as glycolysis or the Krebs cycle, which happens inside the mitochondria, so inside organelles inside the cell. And extracellular enzymes can catalyze pathways such as digestion in the gut. That's outside cells, right? Great. So then what type of reactions do enzymes catalyze? So reactions in metabolism we mentioned happen in pathways. So these can be cyclic, as you can see here in one, or linear, as you can see here in two. So for example, glycolysis is linear. That's the one here. Uh, whereas the Calvin cycle or the Krebs cycle, the Krebs cycle is this one over here, and we'll look at that in the next uh, topic are cyclic. So basically in a cyclic one, every intermediate is a product of one reaction and a substrate of another. Regardless, conversion of energy from one form to another is never 100% efficient. That goes for both cyclic and linear pathways. So there's always a loss of heat energy to the environment. And actually, we as mammals and birds as well, we depend on the heat generated by metabolism to maintain a body temperature higher than the environment. So if you've ever wondered how that's achieved, that's how. Okay, and now we're going to talk a little bit about inhibition, because, of course, enzymes could not be this simple, right? So basically, um, enzymes can be inhibited. There's several ways. So the first one is competitive inhibition. This is basically where you have an inhibitor that binds to the active site, and it blocks the substrate from binding. It's competitive because basically whichever molecule arrives first, the substrate or the inhibitor, wins. 
However, many enzymes actually have a second active site, which is called the allosteric site over here. And a different substance can bind here. Um, and that one, so basically when an inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, it causes the enzyme in its active site to change shape. So it doesn't allow the substrate to bind. In this case, it's non-competitive. Why? Because it's not competing for the active site. As long as the inhibitor binds here, the active site is dysfunctional and the substrate cannot bind. So it's a different type of binding. Therefore, you can see in this graph, right, when substrate concentration is very, very high, it will outcompete the inhibitor in competitive inhibition. And so you basically get similar rates of reaction as if there's no inhibitor at all with a normal enzyme. However, in non-competitive inhibition, the increase in substrate concentration doesn't really affect the rates, right? Because um, you have the inhibitor binding here and changing the shape, and no amount of substrate is going to change that. I hope that was in a clear way uh, to, to understand it. So inhibition can take many ways, but okay, so basically metabolic pathways, all of them need to be regulated, right? You don't want to make too much of something or too little. So a lot of pathways are controlled by uh, feedback inhibition. It's a type of negative feedback, right? Where the product of the last reaction inhibits the first reaction. Uh, the enzyme that is inhibited has an allosteric site to which the end product binds, right? So it's non-competitive inhibition. Uh, and actually inhibiting the first enzyme is really, really clever because it means that intermediate products are not made, so you don't waste energy making them and they don't accumulate if they're not necessary. Um, it's a great way to regulate pathways because if too much end product is made, right, it just switches off the pathway directly. And if there's too little, the pathway will be open. And an example is here, right, the conversion of threonine to isoleucine, where isoleucine can inhibit the first enzyme, which is theonine uh, deaminase. I think it's threonine. I think that's a typo. Uh, this example came up in the specimen paper. Uh, you can watch the video where I explain the specimen paper. So I would pay special attention to this. Okay, and lastly, mechanism-based inhibition. So inhibition, we've talked about non-competitive and competitive, but that's reversible, right? If the inhibitor unbinds from the active site or the allosteric site, it's gone. But inhibition can be irreversible. So this can happen if the inhibitor becomes permanently bound to the active site by forming a covalent bond, as you can see here. Uh, and these inhibitors actually can be lethal uh, if the function of the inhibited enzyme is vital. So for example, penicillin, right? An antibiotic uses this method to kill bacteria. And actually, a lot of chemical weapons uh, are also based on this method because if you need that enzyme to make something your body needs uh, and it's blocked forever, you will die. Okay, so that's the end of the content. Let's do some questions. So the four statements are examples of anabolism and catabolism. Which one represents a type of metabolism which is different to the other three options? All right, three, two, and one. The answer is B. Why? Okay, B is the only anabolic reaction here, right? So when you're forming glycosidic bonds, you're building up a bigger molecule than what glucose and fructose was, whereas all of the rest are catabolic, right? So deamination implies taking away uh, depletion of fat storages, same thing. You're cutting uh, fats into smaller pieces and anaerobic respiration, same thing. You're basically trimming glucoses down. So Next question. Okay, <laughs> isoleucine can be described as an end product inhibitor. Which statement best describes the action of isoleucine? So here we'll see if you paid attention. Uh, pause now, and in three, two, and one. Okay, so it's a non-competitive inhibitor, right? Because we mentioned that it binds to an allosteric site uh, on threonine deaminase, um, and it inhibits threonine, right? I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Just go back if you don't remember. And next and final question. Which of the following statements about enzymes is not correct? Okay, in three, two, and one. C, why? Okay, well, A, they can have multiple active sites. They can have an active site and an allosteric site. B, they are composed of one or more polypeptide chains. Uh, that is true. They can have a quaternary structure. Uh, they catalyze both anabolic and catabolic reactions. That's completely true, right? They catalyze almost all reactions in metabolism, including, of course, anabolic and catabolic reactions. But ester bonds don't really play an important role in maintaining their shape. Um, ester bonds are not really found in proteins as much. And remember, to maintain their shape, you want uh, hydrophobic and hydrogen bonding. So that's the end of this topic, uh, quicker than I expected. I hope everything is clear. If not, ask any questions in the comments. Again, I would ask you to subscribe if you like these videos and enjoy them. And I'll see you next week for C1.2.